Welcome everyone. We'll give everyone a chance to get logged in here and signed on. Um, I wanted to welcome you to our uh, first master class for optimizing bariatric patient care and trends in the sleeve gastrectomy surgery. We have three great panelists today that are going to be presenting and sharing some of their knowledge and expertise with us today. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Lexington <clears throat> Medical for um, hosting this webinar and allowing us. I always love um, uh, being able to share and exchange ideas with other uh, medical providers and surgeons. And so I think this is a great opportunity to do this. Um, and we're very fortunate today because we have um, participants from five different continents and 38 different countries and different time zones. So good morning, afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Alana Chalk. Um, I am a surgeon in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I own a ASC, an ambulatory surgery center, and have a private practice. I also operate at two different hospitals. Uh, I do exclusively bariatric surgery. Um, with a variety of procedures and have been in this particular practice uh, since 2008 where I've been doing exclusively bariatrics. Before that, I was doing a mixed practice with general surgery. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to hear from our panelists today um, to hear what they have to say about uh, their various topics. Uh, we will keep you muted during the um, panel today. However, I would encourage you to write in the chat box any questions that you might have. Uh, at the end of everybody's presentation, we will, um, we will be uh, answering questions from the chat. So please, as we're going along, feel free to type in your questions. If you want it directed at a particular speaker, you can say that. Otherwise, I may direct those questions at the entire panel to get the differences in opinions. Um, so I think that would be uh, fantastic to field all those questions. Um, we have a variety of um, topics this morning uh, that we will present. And um, I think it's going to be really exciting uh, for everyone to uh, jump in and, and learn from this. Um, and hopefully we can generate more uh, webinar series if we can convince our hosts to do that. Sorry, just a plug for that. Um, and uh, in short order, we'll get started. So I wanted to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Paul Wisman. Dr. Wisman is a bariatric surgeon at Bariatrics Florida and Director of Center of Excellence at Northwest Medical Center in Margate, Florida. And he received a surgical education degree at McGill University in Canada, where he then completed a fellowship in laparoscopic surgery. He's been practicing general surgery for nine years, and then after that, and careful research and training, he began weight loss surgery in 2002. Dr. Wisman has since completed over 6,000 cases, which is pretty remarkable, and, and is accomplished at laparoscopic gastric bypass, gastric banding, gastric sleeve, as well as, of course, revisional bariatric surgeries. He also has a passion for teaching and has been involved in the uh, preceptor and proctorship of over 70 surgeons around the world. He continues to present bariatric surgery related topics, many during the, in the US as well as at, in international meetings. So without further ado, I wanted to introduce Dr. Paul Wisman and he's going to be sharing uh, his, his thoughts and his talk with us today. And so I'll let him get started. Dr. Wisman. Thank you, Alana. And uh, thank you, Leon. Of course, for having us, it's, it's a pleasure to do this. <clears throat> and uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to all my uh, fellow bariatric surgeons. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, we do a lot of uh, cases every day and we always have to remember one thing, we cannot have a complication. Obviously that's an impossibility, but there are ways to stay safe. And I'm gonna particularly, um, focus on the leak, avoiding the leak. So um, how do I get to the next slide, by the way? Is it just slow? Hang on 10 seconds. 
Oh, there we are. We can do it that way. So, Dr. Wisman, you stopped your screen share. I don't know if you did that on purpose. No, I didn't. Okay, so uh, disclosures. Um, I'm a proctor, preceptor, uh, or consultant for Intuitive, Lexington, Medtronic, and Olympus. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is avoiding the leek soup. Like any other soup, there are ingredients to that soup. This is a soup we don't want to have. So what I'm going to talk about is trying to avoid all those things that can possibly lead to a leak. Because like any other comp complication, they're, they're combinations of things. We never have a complication because of one thing we did. It's always a combination of a few things. So when you add enough ingredients to that soup, you're going to make it and you really want to avoid it. So I'm going to talk about all these things in, in um, uh, varying uh, times, but first of all, avoiding tension when ligating vessels, obviously that's important. No thermal injury at the GE junction. Min minimal antrum. In other words, I don't take too much antrum. I'm not sure if taking a lot of antrum is necessary for uh, weight loss. I'm not sure if taking a lot of antrum is uh, important for safety, but one thing it does do, it, it, it narrows the sleeve, even if it's at the antrum. Minimize the angles between staples. Make sure that your incisura is wide. Minimal tension when stapling. Leave a cuff at the gastroesophageal junction. And there should be, and what I've discovered lately, and this is, this is an incredible thing because I've been over sewing the staple line for thousands of cases. Every single case I over sewed the entire line. And then I stopped doing it. And, and I stopped doing it because another surgeon was not doing it and he was getting decent results. And I found that it's actually, and I can't say this because it's anecdotal and I don't have literature review on this, but it's definitely as good, if not better. Certainly for bleeding, it doesn't change a thing. So that's something I discovered anecdotally on at least a thousand cases now. So what I'm gonna show now is the dissection at the top because the beginning of the sleeve is pretty straightforward. The only thing I could say about the dissection of the stomach at the greater curvature is to stay inside the gastroepiploic artery. That's not necessarily important in terms of a leak, but it certainly may be important in terms of portal ve uh, venous uh, thrombosis. In other words, you want to take as few splanchnic vessels as you can. Minimize the number of vessels you need to take. So stay inside the gastroepiploic artery. I think that's an important little feature. So here I'm going to dissect the top. And what happens in, in this situation is we tend to over dissect. So here I'm taking the, the very last of the short gastrics here. There is the uh, phrenic vessel. Now you should be as far away from the spleen as possible, hugging the stomach at all times. Absolutely hug the stomach because you should never have a, a, a cut in the middle here. The vessel is going to be very hard to get if you should bleed. So I, I stop here. You can see that I'm at the cross right here. I'm sorry. I will take one more bite here. See, that's the cross right there. Right there. It's that dark red. So once you get this bite here, you stop right there. Do not over dissect that area. It's a dangerous thing to do. Because one of the major, I think, problems leading up to a leak is, <clears throat> is burning the GE junction or thermal injury to the GE junction. <clears throat> I am a proponent for the fact that I do not think that the staple has anything to do with the leak. In other words, firing a staple, the leak does not occur at the staple line. It occurs underneath the staple line at the GE junction. I'm gonna to try to show you the GE junction one more time 
or a couple of times just to get used to that exact view of the spot. Uh, here, I'm just going to show my first stable fire. About the first stable fire, let me just put that on pause for a second. You see how parallel my, my stapler is? I put my stapler in the midline because it's oftentimes a, a straight shot. It's not even necessary to articulate it often because everything comes from the midline, as you know. So I put my 12 millimeter port in the midline and low enough such that the stapler comes in parallel to the stomach, you see? Oftentimes, if, you're, if your port is too high above the umbilicus, you're coming down on it. And I think that's a mistake because then you have angulation immediately. It's almost impossible to put that first staple in, the, in, the, in a good place unless you're parallel to the stomach. So have your stapler low enough. It's about, uh, I'm going to say, one or two centimeters above the umbilicus in most cases. So the first staple fire, you see, when I hold the stomach, I'm always holding it at the level of the vessels. That way there's, there's less rotation of the stomach because obviously rotation of the stomach is another problem leading to a leak. So you want to avoid tension. You want to avoid rotation. I'm not going to take too much antrum and I'm going to probably end up almost in every case about five or six centimeters away from the pylorus. Uh, it just happens to be that number. I, I can measure it so many times. I'm always going to end up with that. You know, once we get used to our te technique and we do the same technique all the time, then we tend to repeat it. And it's very good to get into good habits with that technique. I do use a stent all the time. I'm sorry, Dr. Raftopoulos. Um, so here, let me, I'm going to freeze the image in a second to show you how I prepare for the first cut. So you see, there's so much angle here. This is a stomach that is, is relatively C-shaped. And every stomach, obviously, every different stomach dictates a, a kind of a different angle for you. And I always go in terms of safety. So the first cut is extremely important. I'm sorry that the video is so choppy. I don't know why. I mean, there's the pylorus right there, of course. I hope I'm not being redundant to most of you, but I'm just going to go over those, those salient features that really we have to focus on. So the first staple fire, as we all know, is that most important one that you really want to get really perfect. Um, I'll freeze it when I finally decided on what I'm going to do here. It's so important it takes me a long time. Okay. Oh, what happened there? What happened there? Let me get back to that spot. Oh, I had it. Okay. Uh, this actually looks like a different stomach. You know that? Rita, I might have jumped to another uh, video. Is that possible? Okay. Well, there's the first, there's the first bite. Okay, so you see, let me continue here. I got a little, I don't know what happened, Rita. Um, can you find out what's going on here? Uh, I think I'm going to the next slide somehow. Oh, there, there, there. Okay, hold on. Sorry, everybody. Okay, there we are. We're back. I just got to be careful of what I'm clicking here, I guess. All right. Okay, so there we are. I'm kind of set. And this distance almost always is five centimeters or so. Now, Gray's Anatomy defines the antrum as beginning where the lesser curve meets the stomach. So if you make a straight line on the lesser curve from that spot to the, to the pylorus, that is your antrum. So I always cut into the antrum probably about one or two centimeters, but never much more than that. Now, you, you see what I'm doing here? I'm pulling away the crow's foot. So this is the crow's foot. That defines the incisura. I'm always going to pull it away, and that does two things. 
this staple tends to rotate inferiorly the entire uh, stomach. So I pull it out a little bit here, right there. So I get a nice angle coming away from the, you see how I'm, see the angle is away from the stomach. You don't want to be in a straight line up. Look at that angle I'm making. And that's to make sure absolutely that the, that the incisura is not going to be tight. And I think we should always, even if you have to exaggerate this, I think it's really important to do so because this is going to really be the first ingredient to the soup. Now, the staple has to be fired very slowly. You see what I'm doing? Really slowly. And that, that's something I had to learn because I was firing the stapler so fast. I think that was... Uh, start doing some of the bleeding but when you do that it's just a beautiful staple line see that no problems so that's the first staple line okay and i just wanted to show you that one let's go to the next uh slide here and again i'm at the top of the stomach because this is the important part here the first ingredient of the soup So I'm going to just dissect the top here, always staying away from the spleen. You see, I left a bit, a nice cuff of tissue here. This is where you're going to get some bleeding. So leave a cuff of tissue. Even if you think you're cutting into some of the fundus, that's just going to be removed. I think using bipolar energy is very important as well, by the way. I think that is a safe energy. It does not disperse the heat. And it stays very uh, um, kind of cool when you're when you're not working with it. So you can use it as a dissector. Okay, you see this vessel here is the branch of the phrenic artery that feeds the esophagus. I really do not think it's necessary to take it. I think it's you're not always going to see it. I agree with that, but that's kind of your sign to get to stop working. This is the GE junction right here. And that's the crust. Now, the thing that we do is very interesting that I have found the bigger the patient, the more fat there is, the more over dissection we do of this spot. You don't think you're there, you don't think you're there, and then you are more than there. So I think that stopping early is always safe. Doing a skeletonization of this area is not necessary and is pretty dangerous because that's what's going to lead to a, a leak. And that is the most important ingredient <clears throat> of the soup. This is actually an over dissection itself. There's the phrenic artery. There's the branch to the esophagus. You see, I don't have to do all this. I'm already there. So that's really an important ingredient. The, se the second one, of course, is... Um, is the angle of the first uh, staple. Let me see if I can get to it in this, in this one. We're gonna try one more time. Sometimes it bleeds off of these vessels, but I will continue working. When you pull it, you pull it off the vessels. Okay, there's another one, see? Okay, so the angle is coming out. I love when I have a little bit of stapler left. In other words, if you could manage not to reach the incisura on your first bite, that would be really good. The angle always coming out, making sure you have room here, that your antrum is taken about one centimeter, that you're pointing out and that you're parallel. That's what I look for in my first bite. So here's one, another one here. where I'm taking this, there's the last short gastric. And the short gastrics are important because they come straight up. They're coming straight up from the pancreatic, from the splenic artery or, 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 the, or this area in the spleen. And they, you see the, the length of cuff I take. I'm always against the stomach because this piece of stomach is, is being removed anyways. It's not necessary to be down here. And if you're down here, this, the artery will retract and you will regret it. So I, I think there's always room to, to be a little lower. I'm going to dissect up the top again because I think this is an incredibly important feature 
of the dissection. You're always as far away from the spleen as you can get, doing blunt dissection whenever possible. That is cross, and we're done. You see, I stopped maybe earlier than some of you would have. I don't think it's necessary. Dr. Raftopoulos will be talking about hiatal hernia dissection and everything else when that's necessary. And obviously you need to do more dissection there. But if you're not gonna do that, I think you should stop there. I think it's one of the really important things. Let's look at the, uh, the entire staple line. So here's a nice view of a parallel stapler coming out, leaving a nice incisura here, not quite reaching, and a little bit of stapler left. You see that? I don't use the whole stapler if I can get away with it. And if you staple slowly and you wait your 15 seconds, and 15 seconds can be done, don't worry about it. I know you're dying to get that stapler fired. But if you wait and you staple slowly, you will absolutely love your result. Now you see the second staple, the second staple. So the first stapler comes out, leaves in cesura, is parallel, doesn't use the whole staple line, okay? The second one still comes out a little bit. I still do not come back straight. You don't want to make an angle uh, like 80 or... Remember that the stent here is, is straightening the stomach. It's an artificial line here. When you remove the stent, it's going to be a shape of a C. So you still want to come out. You don't want to absolutely hug that... that, uh, that um, uh, stent yet. Again, wait your 15 seconds, staple slowly. All you have to do is say to yourself, slow and steady as you're stapling, and you'll do a beautiful job, and it'll look like that. Thank you, Dr. Wisman. That was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I don't always get the opportunity to video myself in the OR, so I love watching other people's videos. Um, I think we'll move on to Dr. Crace now. Um, Dr. Mohammed Kreis is joining us. Uh, he's the founder and consultant uh, general GI and bariatric surgeon at Al Kindi Hospital in Amman, Jordan. And he is also owner of the Dr. Mohammed Kreis Center with private practices in Amman and London. And uh, Dr. Kreis Center is an accredited center of excellence by the uh, IFSO. Um, he has completed his medical studies in Jordan and then he continued his surgical training in Britain and France with over 30 years of experience. He is an influential member of several international organizations and has participated in more than 38 scientific courses and 21 conferences worldwide. He is considered a leader in laparoscopic surgery in the Middle East and has performed many surgeries on noble community members, including princes, ministers, and Arab ambassadors. So we're very pleased to have you join us today, Dr. Craze. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, your presentation. And uh, we have here practicing in Jordan a bariatric center of excellence. And it's a high volume center, actually. We uh, did at least uh, more than 30,000 uh, operations uh, for the last 10 years. And a lot of reduce actually. We are receiving patients from uh, nearly 52 nationality from all over the world, from the States, from South America, from Europe and the Middle East. And it is a high volume center actually. And we are uh, sharing our experience and our statistics with the EFSO as a bariatric center of excellence. And we did standardization of our procedures, including the lap band or the gastric sleeve or the bypasses by all types of the bypasses and including the reduce. We have standardization for all these procedures with uh, my team regarding the pre-operative and post-operative and the follow-up even. Uh, our presentation today actually about the uh, trends in gastric sleeve. Gastric sleeve, um, it's actually in the Middle East at least. This is the golden standard now for uh, the bariatric surgery. Uh, and it's the first choice actually in general for all those with morbid obesity. We are doing uh, the uh, sleeves for more than uh, 35 kilogram per uh, meter square as BMI with no, uh, without comorbidity, and we do it for 30 or 35 BMI for the comorbidity patients. 
and uh, including the uh, comorbidity, I mean the diabetes, the hypertensive patients, the dyslipidema, the osteoarthritis, the sleep apneas, and we have very good results actually. And uh, from our practice, just as a message, small message to the audience, uh, the gastric sleep surgery in the Middle East is a very common actually, and we have very, very uh, limited cases. Now, even the Middle East itself, not, no, rather than our uh, center here uh, of leaks, we have standardization of this procedure. That's why we don't have any leak for the last two years, but some, at least we have two cases of zentric thrombosis for the last two years even. But that's why we have to take lessons actually about how to do the sleeves and the follow-up and the pre- and post-operative management of these cases because we have to take care not only about the uh, uh, technical issues regarding the sleeve, regarding the leaks and regarding the bleeding, but the post-operative is very important actually to avoid some of the complications which happened actually for the last two years or even more, the last, uh, more than the last two years, including the uh, thrombosis, mesenteric ischemia, mesenteric thrombosis. Even though our practice, we are very close to the stomach, we are very far away from the gastroepiploic, but the dehydration and uh, one of the factors and patients not receiving the anticoagulation is another factor, actually. That's why in our practice, we have to uh, be very careful, not only on the technical point of view regarding the sleep, but also on the pre- and post-operative follow-up, because it's very important, the hydration of the patient, be sure that they are taking the um, uh, anticoagulation. Uh, we have a patient, our uh, study case today, 27 years old. He is uh, with the BMI uh, 61. Uh, no comorbidity. Uh, as a first choice, we did for him uh, a sleep gastrectomy. And I want to show you our uh, way of doing the sleep gastrectomy. Usually, I used to keep a wide antrum, six to centimeter nearly, and a wide incisura, as Dr. Wiseman mentioned also, the same, we do the same because it's very important uh, for minimizing the, the incidence of leak. And we are uh, very close to the stomach wall, away from the gastroepiploic to avoid the thrombosis of this gastroepiploic and the complication later on will happen from this thrombosis. I usually use 40 t 42, sorry, a French uh, gastric tube. And uh, we try most of the time not to keep the sleeve is very tight. From our studies, from our experience actually, the tight stomach on the sleep stomach, usually they regain weight earlier than the others because they will depend on the sweets with the high calories, but they don't eat the regular food. That's why the tight stomach of less than 40 uh, French gauge usually have uh, incidence of leaks, uh, evidence of regaining of weight more than the others because they will depend on the sweets and they will regain weight uh, earlier. The other uh, point actually here, I do dissection up to the left crust. We have here to be sure, we have to see the left crust. Sometimes the endoscopist, they do endoscopy for the patient before and they said no hernia. But sometimes we find the lipoma or a fatty tissue in the posterior wall of the esophagus, which is not uh, clear by the endoscopy. But that's why this is the site of a hernia, a hernia hernia with a high pressure stomach. That's why we have to be very sure to clean the crura completely. And as Dr. Wiseman said, uh, uh, on the uh, angle of his usually we do our dissection. And we do hiatoplasty for most of the cases. Once we notice that it's loose, the cruras or the vagus junction is loose, even though by the endoscopy it's normal. But sometimes during our practice, while we are doing the surgery, we see some weakness sometimes posteriorly in the crura. But that's why we have to repair. In this case, not. And the other thing, I usually do overrunning sutures. This is a standard procedure for us for the last more than 12, 13 years. We do overrunning sutures. Uh, we don't have leaks. I agree with Dr. Weissman. He didn't do overrunning sutures. But at least we avoid, if we don't do avoid the leaks, we avoid the bleeding. Because most of our patients, they are comorbidly uh, hypertensive, diabetics, and those hypertensive patients, they have more incidence of bleeding if we are depending only on the suture. Fortunately, 
our new standard, uh, our new stables now, it's very homostatic, but we know we uh, uh, need more, a lot of cases to change our practice using these uh, stablers for the homostasis. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the message here in our practice, I do the overturning sutures, wide incisura, wide antrum, left the crust should be cleared, hiatoblastly once necessary or needed, and overrunning sutures, post operative hydration, post operative anticoagulation is very important, and early ambulation. The conclusion for the gastric sleep patient is the safest and the least complication postoperatively. It could be the first uh, choice for a patient with a very high uh, morbidly obese, and we can do convert it to another bariatric procedure later on. It's a quick procedure. It's a 30 minute job. We can, uh, we have a patient last uh, two months, actually 350 kilogram. We have a Jordanian patient. We did for him sleep. Recovery quickly, recovery. If he needs in the future bypass, we can convert it to bypass. But at the first step, why not to start with sleep? Half an hour job, he can go quickly, he can mobilize it quickly, and if he needs later on any procedure, we can do it. But that's why it's a golden standard and it's convertible procedure, no long-term follow-up. We do follow-up for one month and three months and six months, but there is no need for year follow-ups for years. And the most important things we have to teach the patients actually about their small frequent meals. Uh, this is very important. We have a full team of dietitians and they are doing the follow up plus the vitamins, the supplement of vitamins uh, to look healthy uh, for the hair, for the skin. All these vitamins we have to give them for at least two months. And if needed, they can take it more but they should take it. But that's in our protocol. We have to give the vitamins. We have to give the anticoagulation. We have to give the bumper blockers also uh, for a regular period of time, according to the schedule that we are uh, put uh, them on. And uh, for, by this standardization, by these protocols, we have very, very minimal complications and uh, nearly no leaks, as I mentioned, for the last years. And we are receiving some leaks now from uh, the, around uh, different countries around, uh, but it's usually technical things rather than any other else. Uh, but the standard, as I mentioned to you, it is uh, a very standard operation. It's a golden standard in the Middle East. And to me, it's the golden standard and first choice for most of our patients with comorbidity or without comorbidity. Thank you. I can't. I can't. I can't hear you. Right. Okay. Um, thank you for your, your talk. That was wonderful. Um, I wanted to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Raftopoulos. Dr. Raftopoulos is a bariatric surgeon and director of weight management at Holyoke Medical Center in Holyoke, Massachusetts. He is a U.S. trained board certified surgeon and completed a fellowship in bariatric and laparoscopic surgery. Dr. Rotopoulos served as a former chief of bariatric surgery at St. Francis Hospital and Medical Center in Hartford, Connecticut, and has held various teaching positions, including associate professor of surgery at the University of Connecticut and assistant professor of surgery at University of Pittsburgh. He is a surgeon of excellence in bariatric surgery He's certified by the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and the primary investigator in several active and completed research trials. To date, he has completed over 120 national and international podium presentations and peer-reviewed publications. So Dr. Rotopoulos, interested to hear your, your talk today. Oh, just a quick reminder to everybody, please remember to put your questions in the chat um, so that we can get to them at the, the very end. Thank you. All right. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, webinar. Let me just start the presentation. All right. 
So first of all, I want to thank Dr. Chuck for the introduction. I want to thank uh, Lexington for putting this nice webinar uh, together and the, their staff for helping us out with the editing of the videos, which is, was very, very useful and I don't think we'd be able to do it uh, without them. Um, we are in a very unique specialty, I believe. You know, we are all surgeons and we primarily train as general surgeons. However, the philosophy of the general surgeon and the philosophy of the bariatric surgeon is different. And I find that many times when we discuss about outcomes in bariatric surgery, we focusing a lot on safety, which by no means is not important, but we forget sometimes the importance of the other outcomes that we are doing the surgeries for, which is weight loss and also prevention of side effects in the long run while we are achieving weight loss. And my uh, job today is to discuss about my personal experience with how to minimize uh, post-operative gastroesophageal reflux, which is one of the important issues that sleep gastrectomy uh, surgery is uh, related with. So these are my disclosures. And uh, I will start my presentation by discussing a little bit about the, the issue of reflux with sleep, uh, the incidents, the factors uh, related to that. Um, I will show you uh, my personal technique. Uh, and I will also say here that, you know, of course, I enjoyed the videos and the presentation of Dr. Wisman and Dr. Grace. And I'm sure as there are many different kinds of stomachs, there are also many different kinds of surgical techniques and every technique uh, has its own merits and disadvantages. And of course, when I present my technique, I present my own views. I hope that you'll see something beneficial from some of the uh, technical uh, features I use and hopefully you can adapt them in your practice. Uh, many times the techniques we use have to do with how we do the surgery and uh, automatically we adapt the techniques we use to how we do it, uh, where we put the ports, what instruments we're using, what stables we're using. So not every technical feature that we discuss here can be applicable to what you're doing, but I'm hoping that you can see something that may be useful to you as well. After the technique uh, video, I will uh, present to you some of my results and of course the conclusions. So as I said before, you know, reflux is the Achilles heel of uh, sleep gastrectomy. Uh, the instance is very high uh, in many large studies. It can be as high as 60%. And you have to differentiate two, kinds, two different kinds of reflux. There is the reflux that was pre-existing and is persisting after surgery or is worsening. And there is the reflux that, that people didn't have before and develop after the surgery, which is the de novo reflux, which can be also very high, as high as 50% in some uh, series. You also have to uh, uh, be aware of the potential consequences of reflux, which is esophagitis, and some series can be as high as 41%, and even Barrett's esophagus, which is a serious problem, that can be as high as 18%. And in some papers I have uh, reviewed over time, uh, they concluding that the reflux is so high that it's actually higher than any other procedure, even the lab band procedure, which I thought it was the, the association with reflux was, was very high also. But uh, it seems that many studies find that uh, sleep gastrectomy is even more linked to reflux. There are many causes that can be uh, linked to the uh, cause of reflux. So it's not only just one. Uh, and some of the ones that you might have seen and you know about is, of course, hiatal hernias, uh, narrowing in the sleeve, particularly the incisura, but it could be in other areas as well, alias incompetence, H. pylori infection. So let's take one by one of those. Untreated hiatal hernias. There, is a, there are several studies that have actually looked into that, uh, repairing hiatal hernias with the reflux, and they found that actually they do help. If, you, if patients had pre-existing reflux, they can resolve or improve reflux on 68% of, of cases, and that is persisting in many different series. However, the novo reflux did not improve, which means that hiatal hernias by themselves are not the only cause of reflux. And, our, and part of our technique sometimes or other factors may play a role, for, particularly for the de novo reflux. And another important thing we need to consider is, okay, well, let's fix all the hiatal hernias, but unfortunately there is a 11% hiatal hernia recurrence, even high in some series or lower, but there is a recurrence and that's an important thing to consider. So which hernias to repair? Well, obviously, 
the obvious ones you see interoperatively. And I say this because not, unfortunately, bariatric cells don't agree in a lot of different things and a lot of different ways to do things. And unfortunately, even the preoperative workup is not consistent. So for example, I do always an upper GI study. Um, I don't always do endoscopies, I do it selectively, but I do an upper GI study. It doesn't mean that the upper GI tells me everything, but I will tell you how I use the upper GI to help me. But some surgeons don't do anything and they just, the first look they see is what they see inside the abdomen. I will also point here that many times hiatal perineas are missed intraoperatively because I find that in many times the, the camera port is placed fairly low uh, as we tend to put the port view low in different other procedures we perform in general surgery. But I believe that having the port higher allows you to have a better look at the hiatus sometimes. And in a very big patient with a very big liver, sometimes the views you have and not allow you to appreciate well if there is a hydrophenia, especially if you don't do preoperative workup. So how do, so besides the obvious hernias, I consider repairing hernias, even there's, even there's a small hiatal hernia present in the preoperative upper GI. I find from my experience that if there is a hernia there, there is a hernia. And that hernia usually contributes to problems that may get worse after the sleeve. And how many of you have seen people that had sleeve and now present with a moderate sized hiatal hernia? which I don't think it just happened out of the blue. It was pre-existing and it got worse with the weight loss and the, and the fact that the shape of the stomach and its attachments were lost. Another important uh, group of patients you consider the hiatal hernia is those that Dr. Axel Kreis mentioned that there is a weakness in the hiatus. And I find that the weakness in the hiatus is almost, almost every patient has it. And if you actually carefully interview them, the majority have some kind of a reflux problems uh, and the reflex is very common, probably, even if the patients don't, don't tell you that. So if there is a hiatal weakness intraoperatively, in association with obvious reflex on the preoperative upper GI, or if the patient has a high GERD score, I always have patients fill out the, the validated questionnaire for reflex preoperatively, so I know what you're scoring, or if they take medications for reflex, that's another group of patients you might want to be aggressive and consider uh, strengthening the hiatus to prevent a worsening reflux after the surgery. So how do you deal with the recurrence, however? Because as I said before, you can you know, repair all hernias, but you, then you're dealing with the recurrence. Well, good and standardized technique is critical. And I want to emphasize that in my opinion, it's very important that there is an anterior and posterior dissection. I hear this a lot that uh, I found a small anterior hernia and I put a couple of sutures. I can guarantee you that there's, there's, if there is an anterior hernia, there is a posterior component too. And if you don't dissect the conferential of the esophagus, you're not lengthening the esophagus. So not, it's not only the matter of putting a couple of sutures and strengthening, reducing the hole there, but also you need to provide enough length of the esophagus intraoperatively to prevent, to get the G-junction way below the diaphragm. But that's critical to prevent reflex in the future. So endoscopic, I always look where the G-junction is. So I think if you plan to do a hernia, do it right. And I believe if you do a good dissection, anterior and posteriorly, the risk of recurrence is less. Unfortunately, when we talk about recurrence, we have to keep in mind that we talk about different techniques and each technique might have a different impact on recurrence. Nevertheless, despite all of this, the novel reflux did not improve with the height of hernia repair. So that means that other factors play a role. And one of those is a retained fundus, which means basically that the sleeve caliber is not even, that the upper part of it is not as narrow as the rest of the sleeve. And unfortunately, as much as we see all the slides and the diagrams and you see a nice even size sleeve, we all know in reality that's not easy to accomplish. And as much as we love sleeve gastrectomy, as it's a by far easy, easier surgery to perform uh, than the gas bypass, for example, it's, not, it's an artistry to do it well and consistently, especially in challenging cases. So why does the retained fundus matter? Well, it matters in two different ways. Number one, it gives the patient the perception that they have a larger stomach, that they need more food or more liquids to fill with. However, the remaining of the stomach is narrower. So now you have the hourglass phenomenon where you have an upper chamber, you get in quickly a lot of food there, and then it doesn't go anywhere. And then it produces a reflex. So it's critical that the caliber of the sleeve is as even as possible, and especially the upper part. There are technical factors that lead to a retained fundus. One of them is incomplete posterior dissection. 
I know Dr. Wiesman was advocate of not doing much posteriorly, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. It's how you do it. And there is enough vascular space between uh, medially to the splenic artery that actually I use also when I do the pouch and gastric bypasses, where if you get to that groove, you actually, it's a vascular tissue, you're not damaging anything, and allows you to take all the posterior attachments out. Why is it important? Because you may see a, a nice dissection of the sleeve anterior, and you may see a loose sleeve, but if the posterior component is attached, then even if you put the, 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 your, your stapler properly, you won't be able to take that part away because it's attached to something else. So it's very important to look and see if there are attachments and take them. Unrecognized hiatal hernias are also important, particularly if they have a posterior component. Then I've seen that. I've seen cases where anteriorly you couldn't see much, but then there was part of the perigastric fat incarcerated into the hiatus posteriorly. You're not going to see it unless you look under the sleeve. If you have a very large fundus, uh, not every stomach is different. Some stomachs have, have an even size throughout. Some others are very narrow distally, and they have a huge fundus proximally. And I find, in my opinion, that's one of the most challenging ways to actually resect it properly and, and, and keep the sleeve even caliber. Sometimes people have uh, posterior etrogastric adhesions, which if you don't look, you're not going to see. Congenital, from upper abdominal surgery or, or gallbladder surgery, but also pancreatitis, and some of them can be severe. Don't be afraid to dissect them, because if you don't dissect them, remember, they are attached to part of the posterior stomach. You're not going to be able to pull your stomach in a way you want to make the sleeve even if they are attached to something else. There are differences in gastric wall compliance. You're not going to appreciate them sometimes, especially with the bougie. I'm not saying don't use the bougie, but bear in mind that the bougie has also some disadvantages and you're losing the perception of how the tissues feel when you have the bougie there. Sometimes we don't consider the unique geometry of the stomach, particularly near the G junction. And I'm saying this because I used to also use only 60 millimeter stable loads. It's faster, it's quick, it's fewer, there's a cost issue involved. But I will tell you that, this, that the, the stomach is curved and there is a reason that it's curved. And the lesser curvature is curved. So when you have a lesser curvature untouched curve and then you start with a linear stapler laterally and you create a, a, a straight line, you may narrow the stomach somewhere because you have one curved line and a straight line created by the bougie artificially. So you have to respect the geometry. There is a reason the stomach has this, this shape. I believe it does help with the flow of food and liquids throughout the stomach. And sometimes considering using a 45 stapler near the Isisura or near the G junction might allow you to get the right angle to get the next cut so you won't narrow anything. Because sometimes, as you're using the 60 millimeter stapler, you may start in the right position, but sometimes we miss that the tip of the stapler may narrow something. So it's always, you have to also consider that. Another important thing is the stricture. We talked about this before. Again, uh, Boozy, uh, I believe in my opinion, should be, if you're using it, should be aiming towards the pylorus and not towards the greater curvature. I mean, it doesn't mean that this is a no-no, but you have to be aware that if you're aiming the Boozy through the greater curvature, you have, as Dr. Weisman said, uh, you have to be careful to aim a little laterally to prevent narrowing the incisura. If you put the bushy towards the pylorus, I believe you have a little bit better protection, but it's a little bit more difficult sometimes to guide the, the bushy into the pylorus. Again, you need to consider the geometry of the stomach, especially at the incisura. Some stomachs are very, have a very sharp angle, some others don't. Uh, and of course, as Dr. Wisman said, the anterior and posterior dissect traction is critical. You have to be careful when you grab your tissues to grab them at e of opposite sides and not, usually I try to grab laterally exactly where I dissect it anteriorly and medially at the lesser curvature, rather than doing anterior posterior traction unevenly because that can lead to an error. And remember that there are physics law affect the flow. So the Poiseuille's law uh, that controls the flow of a liquid through a tube has to do with the diameter of the tube primarily, but also of the length of the tube. So if the diameter is very large in some areas and narrow in some other areas, that creates turbulence in flow and that creates reflux. And also the law says that if the length of the tube is smaller, the flow is higher. 
that also can lead to reflux. So remember about long and short sleeves, and I will talk about this in a second. Sleeve rotation is another thing I see when I do it, when I revise patients from sleeve to another surgeon. I find sometimes that the staple line of the sleeve is stuck at the under surface of the left lobe of the liver. And that's because the staple line is a sticky point. And once you create it, unless you do something about it, it will glue whatever it gets to, depending on the patient anatomy. So I find that by doing a gastropex, and I'll show you the video for that, you basically recreating the same attachments the stomach had before for a reason. And you're preventing partial rotation or volvulus of the stomach, which can create a functional narrowing of the stomach. And remember also that, as I said before, every stomach is different, the geometry is different. And when a stomach has a very sharp angle of the incisura, and it doesn't cause a problem to the patient, of course, before the surgery, it may do afterwards, because now you artificially narrow the stomach, and it wasn't planned to be like this. So you have to adjust for that potentially, and position the stomach in a way that that angle is not there. I'm sure many of you have done endoscopies in people with sleeve, and sometimes negotiating the scope through the incisura, although there's no true narrowing, can be very challenging. And I believe that's because the stomach has partially rotated and, and, and they had the pre-existing sharp angle and that can cause a, a reflux in a functional way. The short sleeve issue. I, I do, I'm more advocate of uh, dissecting close to the pylorus, not two or three centimeters, but I go a little bit more laterally. So three, four centimeters is where I start my sleeve. Thinking again, the Poisson-Lis law and, and the, the, fa the fact that the length of the, of the tube matters in controlling the velocity of the, fl of the fluid into the tube. And as a, an example, uh, my average specimen length is about 25 centimeters and Reviewing the specimen length of patients I see in my practice at Hatchley Vesper, and they came to us for inadequate weight loss or reflux problems, they considered the revision is by far less than in, in my practice. And I believe that plays a role to some extent. So try to aim at least for a, for a three specimen over 20 centimeters, send the specimen in the pathology, keep track of your specimen length. I think, I think they do matter. And there is some literature to suggest that longer sleeves may have better weight loss too. There are other factors. One thing I have found is H. pylori. I do treat the H. pylori periodically. I do, I do breath tests and I treat it and I repeat it. But sometimes people are resistant and I always have the uh, pathology specimen of the stomach to be examined. And I treat it post-operatively because there is an association with H. pylori. And this is the result of my practice that esophagitis or Barrett's was present uh, in 60% of patients that had positive H. pylori post-operatively. And I saw none of that if the H. pylori was negative. So there's definitely an association. It may not be the only factor, but it's something to consider uh, to aggressively treat. So this is a, a, a video, uh, a pattern piece of, of different cases that I put together to show you different uh, parts of my technique that I think I found useful. So this is a dissection of a, of a patient with a larger fundus. Um, and again, as Dr. Wiesman said, it's very important to get medially from the gastrointestinal artery for a lot of reasons. You don't want to disrupt that arcade because it can lead to portal vein and superior mesenteric thrombosis, but also it leads you to the right plane. If you start dissecting laterally, you may get in the no man's land you know, uh, area and you get close to spleen and other, and other structure. You want to get very close to the stomach and good lateral traction it's very important to actually see the arcade and avoid it because sometimes the arcade is very close to the uh, gastric wall and unless you retract laterally, you're not going to be able to see it or even if you see it, you're not going to be able to avoid it. So you have to be careful about uh, doing that. Another important thing that I do, as I said before, is uh, after I complete the anterior dissection, sometimes I don't complete it all the way to the hiatus. I leave the last uh, area there because sometimes it's very close to the spleen. I don't see it very well. I don't have the right angle with my instruments. And I don't like to dig my, uh, my uh, uh, harmonic scalper or if you use the, uh, you know, the Covidian instrument, uh, the ligature. I don't want to try to dig it and create area of dissection. I like to see what I'm cutting. So sometimes I will stop. I will go back distally. I will complete dissection distally. That allows me to mobilize the stomach medially much more, and that allows me to see posteriorly better. And then I start 
retracting the splenic artery laterally, and I get into that avascular space I told you before. That gives me an area to dissect while I'm seeing what I'm doing and clearly seeing every vessel and cauterizing specifically. I don't blindly put the instrument to cut whatever I see. In many cases, it may work, but if you have a difficult case that you have a lot of fat and you don't see what you're cutting, you may get into a lot of bleeding. So I, I like the posterior dissection for that purpose also, but I also like it because it allows me to dissect posteriorly and have the whole stomach completely uh, uh, free uh, without any adhesions. Dr. Ratopoulos, thank you so much. That's a great talk and a very controversial uh, discussion about uh, reflux with our GI colleagues and some of our- Can I show a few more things I think are important uh, before we, let me see if I can move a little bit. Uh, on to questions right now because we only have a few more minutes left for questions. So I, I appreciate that. Okay. I have a question for you though, specifically about your gas. While, while we're talking, I'll leave the video playing so they can see other parts of the procedure and they can ask questions to the future. Yeah. So your gastropexy, are you doing the gastropexy to the omentum? Yes, uh, but, but I do it exactly at where I cut it. I don't pick any piece of omentum and connect it. I try to do it exactly where I divided uh, uh, the anterior uh, sarcastic vessels. Sometimes it can be challenging because there are vessels there, so you have to be careful to choose a spot that there is no vessel. Uh, sometimes I'll take a small piece of the fat posterior from the vessel, but I try to maintain the exact way it was before. Uh, and, and, and I do at least four or five sutures. I want to point out about that also, that the sutures I put, I don't put them randomly. Norm, I mean, it's natural that the step line will have some zigzags, even if you pay attention to make it uh, this is where you can see the vagus nerve there, uh, the dissection of the hiato hernia. So, uh, so there are going to be some zigzags on the state line. So I, I look and see, and wherever there is a, a zigzag, I take the inner part of that zigzag in the state line and I pull it out. So the whole st stomach, the sleeve, is even and is pulled out and it doesn't cause narrowings, uh, functional narrowings in different areas of the sleeve. That's perfect. And then, Dr. Price, I had a question for you as well. During your presentation, you, you do surgery in different countries, correct? Yes. Yeah. So um, what happens when you're in Oman and somebody um, in the UK has a complication or they call you? Do you have colleagues there that help you? Yes. There's a yeah. lot of yes. Need about yes. And yes. I have a team there. I have a colleague there who is doing follow-up for the cases that we do usually there. Well, we have regular follow-up with our colleague there as a part of the, our team. And if there's surgical intervention that's needed, do you have a surgeon there that will back you up? Uh, we have to have all the time a uh, surgeon to back uh, us up uh, while we are traveling here or there. That's why uh, we have the, a good team, actually, doctors in Amman and doctors in UK for the post-operative follow-up. And uh, uh, Mr. Leon, possibly he knows her, she was with us here in Jordan, and now she's based in St. Mary Hospital and King's College of London. She is uh, doing the follow-up for my patients who are doing there. That's great. As You're part of our team, actually. Fortunate to have support like that. I, I do surgery on from uh, neighboring states up in Alaska, things like that. And, and it can be a challenge in transporting those patients back to us, but we're usually able to do it if it's something serious. Dr. And you know, from a man to London, it's four hours. Just follow <laughs> four hours by plane. It's not far away. <laughs> it's not as the states long away to go. <laughs> Dr. Wisman, you are one of the few people who's operating in an outpatient ASC, um, as well as a hospital, right? Yeah. And um, I'm wondering if you're, a couple questions. One, has your business picked up with COVID as more patients are moving to an ASC setting, at least in the United States? And two, are you getting them out the same day or are they having an overnight stay with you? Well, the, the, the interesting thing uh, about the first question you asked is that I don't think I could have sold it to a patient before COVID if I had asked them, can I do the surgery in an outpatient center? They probably would have said no. 
but but now what I'm telling them is that first of all, I don't even have to say it. I, I often I, I I'll I'll do it this way. W would you like me to do surgery in an outpatient center or the hospital? And then they'll say, why do you ask that question? I say, well, you know, there's no patient in an outpatient center that has COVID or ever did, and we're not allowed to have any visitors. So it's absolutely clean. Now that sentence would be completely, <laughs> we never would have said that, but so they'll, sometimes they'll choose a hospital. Sometimes they choose an outpatient, but by far and away, they'll tell me whatever you think is better. So it really has changed the whole dynamics of it. And the patient, and your second question is, the patient stays 23 hours and 59 minutes. In other words, less than a full day, but definitely overnight, because I'm always worried about bleeding. That's the one thing we cannot control, no matter how good we are. There's always going to be one, maybe in a thousand, that's going to bleed, and we have to be ready for that patient. So for that reason, um, I keep the patient overnight. Interesting. Yeah, I'm doing surgery in ASC. And because of our staffing issues, we've actually gone to same day discharge. So we have an extended uh, recovery for four to six hours, and then we send them home. And that was motivated by changes associated with COVID. Mm -hmm. We have a, one last question. I don't want to run over too much of, um, from the chat <clears throat> regarding reflux in uh, patients. And the question is, is whether um, earlier on, smaller bougies were used, and did that lead to sort of the bad rap that the sleeve gets for having reflux? And so, if you use a little bit slightly um, larger bougie, uh, would that decrease the incidence of um, GERD? Overall, I agree with everything Dr. Ruftopoulos was talking about with um, fixing hernias and, and H. pylori and whatnot. But, but from at least the primary care colleagues, um, the sleeve has a bad rap for for reflux. What do you guys think? Dr. Price? Dr. Price, opinion on that? I, I can't hear you actually. Yeah, in the so, you, Can you, I didn't hear you. Is using a small bougie in the past, um, when we first started doing sleeves, has that given the sleeve a bad rap in terms of being associated with reflex overall? Uh, sorry, Mr. Rupp, we didn't hear you from the beginning, actually, if you can read the question. Um, does using a smaller bougie early on when the sleeve first got started, give the sleeve gastrectomy bad reputation for reflux now? I yes. Think yes. Yes, I agree with you. Actually, the smaller the bougie, the more the reflux, the earlier the getting of it. Yeah. So that's why we go to the wider bougie, 40-42, with overrunning. It's less reflux, and they didn't again wait. They will not depend on the sweets. They are not sweet eaters. So they can depend on their regular food with normal calories rather than go to the sweets with high calories. So they don't have early regaining of weight. By advice, all and why they're bougie. Perfect. Um, so in respect for everybody's time, we've gone past the hour. Uh, I want to thank our esteemed panelists. Thank you. Um, your presentation. I think they were great, very informative. I certainly want to keep chatting with everybody now. It's a shame we only have an hour. Um, and I also want to thank our host, um, Lexington Medical, for putting this on. And hopefully we can look forward to future presentations and webinars um, from them. Thank you. Um, and then uh, we didn't get to all the questions. It looks like Dr. Um, where is it? One of the doctors, um, McClellan, sorry, I'm not being able to, Walter, had a question too. Lexington will reach out to you to answer that question um, just because we don't have time at this moment to go through all the data with you. Um, but they'll reach out to you to get to that. So again, everybody, thank, thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed having you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye.